This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. So this is pretty surreal for me. Uh, this is Ryan Sprague from Somewhere in the Skies, and I am reporting on location in the basement office. That's right. I am inside the basement office with Stephen Greenstreet and Nick Pope. So you guys know what that means. I think we're getting a little bit more of the basement office. So guys, thank you. Thank you for having yeah. me here, and thank you for doing this today. It's awesome meeting you. I'm so glad this happened. <laughs> it's crazy. I know. you. You. We see each other on all these TV shows or podcasts yeah. listen to, um, but then you see each other in the flesh, and you're like, whoa, it's real. Yeah. It's actually real. Yeah. Yeah, and this set is exactly what I uh, envisioned my... my aspiring basement to look like but yeah <laughs> how does it feel to be back in the basement office it feels good i mean it's been a long time it's been a while so it was surreal you know being back and i've changed i've changed as a person the person i was when i was last in the basement office is a different person than the the person who's sitting here now <laughs> and so i i look at it differently it's charming and it's uh, it represents a part of me that's evolving Right. Well, let's talk about that for just a minute, if you don't mind, man. So for anyone who follow, follows hashtag UFO Twitter or is, you know, into this community like we are, you dropped off of Twitter, like the one place a lot of us got our news from you, from a lot of other people. And um, everyone was like, oh, what happened? So, of course, the conspiracies start mounting when yeah. no one has the true answer. So I got to ask, what? Uh, why did you decide to leave us for a little bit and what made you want to come back? Well, I think it, it, the answer is twofold. One, I was like, I found myself on Twitter a lot, on Twitter a lot. And that happens when you get more and more followers and you're engaged in more conversations. You're always checking Twitter and going back to Twitter and replying on Twitter and thinking of the next tweet and things like that. And I had to, a, a show to prepare. I had Basement Office Season 3 where I was going to be tackling topics I had no idea about. I had no kind of like education on some of these topics and I wanted to be up to snuff. I wanted to be educated and researched and I found Twitter to be distracting. <laughs> you know, like I had books to read. I had files to go through and part of the reason I nuked my Twitter was like, okay, for the next three to four weeks, I'm just going to full on read and prepare for season three. I've been there. Like, there's been so many times where I just want to leave social media and do research. And I think that's kind of the most responsible thing you can do. Otherwise, you're just going to be influenced by everything you see coming in. You'll get distracted by the uh, arguments going on. So, no, I, I truly respect that. Um, well, let's, I guess, what you guys are willing to share, since Nick is here, season three. Is there anything you can tease to us? about what we can expect with season three of The Basement Office. Well, let me jump in, and I, I'm not... I, I think we need to be careful. Absolutely. I don't think we should unpack any spoilers, but I think what I would start by saying is that, my goodness, since season two wrapped, an awful lot of things have happened, events, and also, in parallel with those new events... Old events have been reappraised, reevaluated. We are perhaps looking through a different lens. So I think season three was called for, and it's very timely that we do this. And I, I'm going to obviously defer to Stephen on, on how much he wants to reveal, but people can, I think, look ahead to some surprising twists and turns mm -hmm. and some material that, shall we say, might not make everyone happy bunnies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> happy bunnies. <laughs> I think one of the cool things that happened during shooting season three was like Nick and I got kind of feisty. And that was awesome when we kind of like we upped our energy and we really there are some cool moments where we were both passionately going uh, after something. And that was something that we really haven't seen. We've seen a few times, but it was more jocular, I think, in the 
former seasons. And so we get into it this season and it's awesome. Uh, and just in general, I would say this season is about like what I did. It's it, it's a metaphor for my journey of the last year, which is instead of waiting for the next breadcrumb, like all UFO Twitter is, you get the breadcrumb and you hold on to it. And you're like, how oh, precious the breadcrumb. Mm-hmm. And then the next breadcrumb jumps, you know, drops and you run over to it. Oh, the next breadcrumb. I actually about faced and I turned around and I looked at the entire trail of crumbs that have dropped for the last few years. And I said, I'm going that way. I'm going to slowly walk backwards and follow all the crumbs back to the source, turn around and see if I end up in the same place. And that's what season three is about. I love that you're like almost reverse engineering in a sense or (laughs) or walking in rewind. And I think Stephen's on a journey here right? and and has been on one, is still on one, a, a journey to try and make sense of this amazing um, phenomenon with an 80 year backstory all sorts of twists and turns and a real wilderness of mirrors where often things are not what they seem and my role i think has always been i guess to offer a bit of insider perspective as someone who sat within government looking at this topic not professing to have all the answers not saying to Stephen oh this is the absolute truth but as we've seen in basement office and we'll see much more of in season three helping Stephen contextualize some of this helping Stephen find a way to his own truth and his own interpretation of where we are with this topic spoiler alert there will be drones. <laughs> oh, it was just that was my next question, man. Um, a lot of people on UFO Twitter wanted to know: um, Will you be talking about drones and their place in this entire mystery? I mean, it's the biggest nuisance a UFO re- researcher could ask for in terms of if they believe this is something non-human or whatnot. But let's be completely honest: ninety-nine percent of what we look at in the skies probably could be explained conventionally some way somehow but yeah will you be tackling drones this season drones are fascinating drones are rad drones are awesome it's my current late it's obsession as of late and so of course that has that is bled over into season three and i think i've dug up some pretty incredible stuff you know stuff not many people have heard about well nick you mentioned government and i want to get us up to current day right now. I mean, what was it a few days ago? The amendment in the uh, National Defense Bill was passed. We're getting some of what Senator Gillibrand and Marco Rubio and a lot of these politicians asked for from the U.S. government. Um, And then we also have the Pentagon, the Department of Defense, wanting to create their own group to look into this. So we almost have dueling UFO programs, groups, studies going on, which is crazy to think about in moving into 2022, that this is where we're at and what has happened in the past few years. So I'd love to get your insight first, Nick. What do you make of the AOI MSG versus ASRO or whatever it is now? Um, What do you make of all this stuff going on within the American government? There is certainly a bit of a dogfight going on over this. I mean, clearly when Senator Gillibrand Gillibrand? Gillibrand? Gillibrand. You know, I'm a Brit. I can get away with with mispronunciations (laughs) and people say... Anyway, her amendment subsequently endorsed and, and, you know, became the Gillibrand-Rubio amendment. This this was absolutely groundbreaking. It would have taken the study of UFOs within government to the next level, a a level that we certainly haven't seen before. Uh, Much closer integration between the military and the intelligence community, a a proper joined-up response, much more accountability. And into her amendment, of course, was was this proposal of of effectively a a sort of oversight committee with organizations like the Galileo Project, Mm -hmm. run by Professor Avi Loeb, out of Harvard, being able to nominate people to sit on it, the uh, Scientific Coalition for Ufology and and such like. Sadly, that's the one big thing that didn't survive the negotiations. And when I say the negotiations, of course, what what happened was then after the Gillibrand Amendment, uh, the Pentagon came out with its own 
basic announcement mm -hmm. saying this is what we are going to do, AOIMSG. And I think there was some gamesmanship here. I think what they were doing was saying, look, uh, she's getting support for this amendment, but if we can show that we're already gripping this, maybe, maybe you know, we can walk it back a little. And, and so there's some negotiation, but it's very good news. Although the only sad thing, as I say, is the, the oversight committee didn't, didn't make the final cut. Pretty much everything else important did. So we are going to get this, this much more joined up response. We are going to get more oversight and accountability. And we are going to get at least an annual public report mm -hmm. on, on what's going on. So th that's a very long answer. I apologize for that. The short version is this. Congress is gripping this and they are going to make sure that the military and the intelligence community take it seriously and give us some answers or give them some answers. Of course, that's say. the $64,000 question yeah. is Congress, you know, the various committees, um, they will get some answers. The public, not so much, but we will wait and see. Any thoughts on that, Stephen? Are we going to see anything, the public? What do you think? Well, I think first and foremost, and especially in my research for season three, there's a problem. There's an issue. No matter how, what you think it is, there is an issue. There's a safety issue uh, with unidentified, unauthorized objects. The number of near misses are way too much. Hell, one is way too much. And there have been dozens and dozens and dozens. We are in the middle of an absolutely infuriating, unacceptable policy when it comes to unidentified objects in the sky. Something's got to change. So I see all of this stuff as, a, as greatly positive. While I disagree on what will be found and what will be discovered, we need to discover it. What's up, guys? Ryan Sprague here, and I'm just dropping in to remind you about our Patreon campaign. Somewhere in the Skies is always free to consume, but it's not free to create. So if you want to help the show on a monthly basis, we have tons of rewards for you in return, including shoutouts on the show and website, bonus content and episodes, and free merch. Want to be my guest or pick a topic for the show? You can do that too. So if you'd like to learn more and to help support the show, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. Thank you and keep looking up. Nick, on a personal level, there was recently some news that uh, the Kelvin incident was going to remain classified for immeasurable more decades in the MOD. And a lot of people wanted to know, what, uh, where do you stand now, having experienced and been a part of the investigation of this photo, this event? Um, are we any closer to knowing what happened there? Uh, within government or in the public, will we ever know what happened with the Calvine incident? Possibly not. I've seen various ufologists speculate and there are all sorts of theories doing the rounds, but the, the bottom line is this. Uh, these six photos of this diamond-shaped object taken um, in Scotland in 1990 uh, were looked at at the time by the Ministry of Defence and we were not able to identify the craft. What happened then was, obviously, lots of different people in the department had copies of these photos. Um, and, and we had, for example, a poster-sized enlargement of the best one on our office wall in Secretariat Air Staff 2A, room 8245, MOD main building. And it was there for a couple of years. One day, my head of division... Uh, took it down because he had convinced himself that it could only be some sort of secret prototype, hypersonic, maybe US spy plane, and therefore not the sort of thing that we should have on the office wall. Years later, um, the MOD started a program to declassify and release the files, and and people were saying, oh, great, we'll get to see the, the Calvin photos. And uh, nope, the... the photos and and certainly the enlargement seem to have disappeared 
So what what we have left is is basically a, a very poor image of photocopy, low resolution. I did work on a recreation of it with with a graphic artist in LA for a TV show, and we we produced something which was really really good. So now when you read about this. The, the image that the media use is is virtually spot on. Right. And that's not just me saying so. A number of MOD colleagues who either worked in that office or who worked in the division and, and you know, saw it on our wall have said, I think, you know, not least on, on my various social media feeds when they see that photo. Oh, yeah, that's it. You got it. You nailed it. The story about what's being kept secret isn't quite what it seems. Um, there, there has been talk that, that you know, the, the photos will, will be, they've been sort of reclassified, we've still got them, they're in the files, the file won't be released till about uh, 2072 or 2076, something like that. Um, that's not quite what the story is. The, the story is that the identity of the photographers is, is being withheld. And those sorts of personal details, other personal details of MOD officials, including intelligence officials who were involved in the investigation, that's in the original hard copy photo um, you know, file of this, the case file. That is what is not going to be released. So it's it's not even... A fact, you know, you're going to get to that date in the far future, you won't suddenly find, oh, there are the photos. They'll either turn up or they won't. Now, I'll tell you where I think they are, or at least where some copies of them are, in the ATIP and ORSAT files. Because one of the things that did happen with this is that it was, it was sent to CIA and, and various other U.S. agencies. So I wouldn't be surprised, given the amount of leaking that has gone on with with number of photos, videos, documents, and such like, I would not be surprised if the Calvin photos turned up in the United States and not the United Kingdom. You heard it here first. That's right. Somewhere in the sky is exclusive. Stories like that is why Nick is definitely going to stay the co-host of the basement <laughs> office. <laughs> That's awesome. I love that. Um, well, right now I am staring into the eyes of a wolf on the background here at the basement office. So kind of wrapping things up here, guys. I know you've been filming all day. So um, thank you for being so gracious with your time. But I got to ask, this new book came out, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon, where you are now learning again that maybe some of the mainstream media got things wrong at the very beginning in 2017. And we're learning that this ATIP program was working on pennies while, you know, this bigger program hap happening at Skinwalker Ranch was the actual program to get the somewhat $22 million. Um, so I got to ask, what do you guys think of everything going on with Skinwalker Ranch? Will it play a role in this unraveling of truths or disclosures in 2022. And uh, yeah, what do you make of all that? Anyone who wants to take that? I, uh, the answer is yes. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> the answer is yes to all of the above. And it does play a major role. And, you know, that funny enough, that book came out in the towards the end of my journey. My journey where I had I had turned around, like I said previously, and I was following the breadcrumbs backwards. What was the first breadcrumb? What was the first domino? Who pushed it? Who dropped it? How did it end up there? What That was my interest. How did we get to where we are, to where the Gillibrand Amendment exists? You know, that is just another domino. Let's go back to the beginning and let's look at this fresh again. And, you know, I think right on cue, Skinwalkers at the Pentagon came out, you know, because that, that's something that happened a while ago. Details we hadn't heard about. And you can take one, change one detail about an object, and it can look completely different. You can remove one thing from something, and it can take on a whole new picture. And I think that's the theme of this season. Nick, anything to add about Skinwalkers at the Pentagon? It's a fascinating book. It's an important book. And clearly there are 
I'll say this politely, uh, rival narratives at play. So a very short answer from me to this, following my previous rather lengthy ones, things are murky and things are not necessarily what they appear to be. Welcome to Ufology. Well, last question, guys. Um, any last words from you guys about uh, what's to come in 2022, whether with the basement office or just the UFO conversation overall? What do you want to leave our listeners looking forward to, I guess, moving moving forward here? Um, I think that one of the messages I would I would leave with is one that I've delivered a few times the last few months, which is... Um, question everything. It's okay to question everything. Uh, be worried if you're comfortable. Be worried if you trust someone. And, and, and in something like this, where it is obvious that the intelligence community has had played a role, a strong role for decades, we should never feel comfortable that we know what's going on or that we that we're being led in the right direction. And I want to challenge people. I have challenged people and I, I may lose every single fan of the basement office. I am risking that by doing season three. <laughs> and I'm willing to do that because I think it's important. I think it's important that people stay wary of what's going on. And I, um, I will share one analogy that I, sh uh, that I share in season three. If you are a boat in the ocean on a destination to say the truth. And that boat is just one degree, one degree off course after many days and years, it's gonna be so far away from its original destination, it won't even see it in the horizon. And I guess this season of Basement Office, I'm readjusting the boat. Any last words, Nick? Well, I think as Stephen said, there has been how shall I put this? Some dramatic tension between us in this season three that maybe wasn't there certainly to this extent in seasons one or season two. And I think in one sense, it would be a very boring world if everyone agreed with each other all the time. And what you will not necessarily see in season three is Stephen and I nodding and agreeing on absolutely everything. <laughs> there, there are... There are some differences, but what I would leave your listeners with is, is this. Look, what, wherever we end up with this, with, with season three of, of The Basement Office, but with the wider story that is now unfolding, expect the unexpected. Don't be afraid to say at any point, if the data are pointing that way, I was wrong. You know, it's it's OK to change your mind about something. And wherever we end up, we are living in exciting times. And there have been developments on this topic, which I think four years ago would have been inconceivable. And people say, is there more to come? Well, the best indication of what's going to happen in the future is is what's happened in the recent past. So, yes. I confidently predict there is more to come. Exciting is an understatement. I'm excited, guys. When and where, if you can share, uh, will we be able to see The Basement Office Season 3? That may be classified. That may be classified, <laughs> Nick. Classified for now. Yeah. Stephen Greenstreet, Nick Pope, thank you so much for your time today and for allowing me into the basement office. I feel like I'm, uh, I'm part of the club now. So yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. It was good to talk to you. Somewhere in the Skies is produced by Third Kind Productions in association with the Entertainment One Podcast Network.